I think we could get started if everyone's um, ready. So thank you uh, all again for joining us on this very exciting uh, changes to the code. Uh, I know numbers of us are dealing with it in our firms and maybe slightly overwhelmed. I do want to premise this uh, as all of us on this call um, who have put this material together are just architects and engineers. Uh, we are not professionals in this. This is our interpretation um, as we're working through. So we, you know, we may have, uh, we actually disagree in, in, the, in the group a little bit sometimes as well. So there's, because there's interpretations. So please understand uh, that we're working through it the same as you are. So uh, thank you. This is a, a DOER critical code series. So we'd like to have this as a series. This is our first, um, our fundamentals, understanding there's a lot in the new stretch and opt-in codes. And we really want to just cover those high level fundamentals. This series will continue as we uh, move forward and we'll have a more dedicated residential and then a more dedicated um, commercial discussion. And then our hope is actually to have a more uh, dedicated discussion about where the code will be going from here, meaning how does climate justice come into this? And uh, are there uh, aspects of embodied carbon that we can start to bring in? You know, knowing the, that there's a lot of points that need to move forward. So with that, Allison, if we can have the next slide. We've broken this talk up into these categories. Um, there's a lot more that uh, could be, but keeping to that fundamentals concept. So first we'll start with the compliance pathways, you know, where Allison and I will walk us through the buckets and overlays, um, and then the adoption timeline, because as we know, we're in adoption for some portions, but not others. Then we'll dig directly into the residential, then the commercial, and then the commercial opt-in stretch. And then finally, we'll share with you the resources we've used to create this and open it up for questions and answers. Now, I will also say that uh, there will be a lot of questions throughout this, I suspect, and we'd like to try to hold them to the end, but please put them in the chat as you're thinking of them and we'll address them at that time. We've saved a decent amount of time. Uh, we'd like to save you know, approximately half or, or at least a half an hour, 45 minutes to a half an hour of time to have that question and answer because we feel that that's going to be a huge portion of how we're all working through this. So now, uh, Allison, thank you. So the, to talk about who you will be seeing today. Um, myself, I'm Laura Fott. I am with Feingold Alexander Architects and I'm also the co-chair of the COAT Committee on the Environment, the BSA Coat Committee on Environment Committee. We, uh, the BSA Coat and Codes Committee are co-sponsoring this, but there's also been a large effort by the Boston Area Sustainable Design Leaders and um, a number of other folks. So there will be the group of us presenting, but please know there has been a lot of other people who have inputted information here. So the presenters are, Myself and Allison will be moderating and um, you know keeping us moving along. Allison Nash from Sasaki, and then the residential present presenters will be Amy Sheehan Latvakoko from um, DSK and Christian Perrin from Allied Consulting Engineering. Then we'll move on to commercial, where Patrick Murphy from Vanderweil, Jacob Knoll, and Michelle Fennell um, from BR Plus A. So. That will be the uh, overall group, but please know that especially during question and answer, we'll have more folks that can weigh in because there have been so many people who have been working through this. So then moving on to Allison. So um, since this is a fundamentals course, we wanna make sure everyone's kind of on the same page with what is a green community. Um, so in Massachusetts, if you're not familiar with the stretch code, cause it's never applied to your projects before, um, there are 300 municipalities that have signed on to the Green Communities Agreement, which means there's funding that comes into their city or town in exchange for adopting a stricter stretch code. We are super excited in the sustainability community because for the first time we feel like the stretch code is really stretchy and it's going to apply to 
really almost all projects in Massachusetts. So it's great um, for our future climate here in our state and for our leadership that we already have so many communities that have signed up to do this. So how do we start thinking about this now that we know that stretch code is gonna to apply to our projects? A good way to start thinking about it is in terms of like, what bucket are you in? <laughs> so where are you? Are you in one of the 50 municipalities that has not signed on to the stretch code? Then you're gonna really be looking at the base energy code as applying to your project. You don't have to think about the stretch code at all. However, that's only 50 cities and towns and that could change. And that really applies to like new construction renovation that you're gonna go the traditional pathway with the Massachusetts amendments. If you're in a green community and you're a project of a certain size, which we'll get into later, um, you're gonna be dealing with the stretch energy code. For most of us, that means you're gonna be looking at the stretch code for the first time. In the last iteration, it applied to really large buildings. The square footage has come down a lot to align with um, building energy disclosure ordinances that are at lower thresholds. So we're really looking at residential buildings, um, multifamily buildings, all really, this is really gonna envelope um, and apply to a lot of projects that it hasn't applied to before. Um, if you are in Brookline or Watertown, you're also, and you're planning a project there, you are gonna want to look into detail at the opt-in code. So that overlays on top. So you'll be, you'll be in that bucket. You'll look at IECC, you'll look at the Massachusetts amendments, you'll look at the stretch code amendments, and you'll look at the specialized code appendices. So all of these kind of lay on top in that bucket. So the way DOER kind of presented it in their um, December technical guide was a kind of this paper overlay. But the buckets also kind of help you get your head straight. Um, so these are ways, you know, us visual thinkers can start to really understand which, um, how, to, how to deal with the code. This is just another way to visualize it. Um, a group of us really um, also visual thinkers being architects, uh, we were like, how do we, how do we start thinking about this? Like if we have a specific project. So we're, this is a draft on the screen of kind of a decision tree that we've started um, that shows kind of, you know, if you are a new construction project and you're residential or commercial use, like how do you start figuring out what applies to your project if you know that stretch code applies? So at the bottom, you'll see this, um, the rainbow colors, Residential is kind of in the pink and red if you follow that branch down. And there are different um, ways to look at how the commercial code would apply to your project depending on the size and how tall it is and that kind of thing. So um, we're hoping to get this a little bit more in, um, developed, but the DOR's technical guide, which we have a link to at the end, also has decision trees that are helpful. So to, to look at that a different way, um, if we're diving into the buckets. Um, we're looking at these three buckets, regular code, <laughs> updated stretch code, and specialized opt-in code. And where do these apply? What are the kind of big picture things? So as I said before, the regular energy code, if you're not in a green community and the project's new construction, later this year in July, um, IECC 2021 with Massachusetts amendments are going to apply. The BBRS has not promulgated this code, but there is draft language out if you need to take a look at it because you're planning a project now. The updated stretch code, um, we're going to dive into a lot deeper today because that has a lot of um, Massachusetts amendments that are specific. There are two IECC 2021 that Massachusetts has really like raised the bar um, for the first time the stretch code will apply to alterations, additions, not just new construction. So if you're an alteration level three building or you're a tenant fit out in a core and shell building for the first time, it's the first tenant fit out, you will need to look at the stretch code and make sure you're complying um, with what it says. The opt-in lays on top or is an addition to the stretch code requirements um, and municipalities and towns individually vote to adopt that. As of this presentation, Brookline and Watertown have adopted it and we expect at least the 10 municipalities that are um, 
uh, doing the fossil fuel free pilot program, the gas ban program with the state will opt in. So there's a lot of votes on the docket. And this, um, these provisions kind of build on top of the stretch code. So to get a little bit into how the alteration, addition, and change of use might apply, um, if your alteration, you know, level three, Massachusetts has amended, it's not, uh, you have to follow some chapter four requirements if you're doing an alteration, which is unusual. Um, you have to look, look at the envelope, you have to look at mechanical systems, et cetera. Addition, it really depends on the size of addition, what applies whether you follow the addition section or new construction. And then also if you're doing a change of use, you'll need to look at that. We are gonna make these slides available later, but we wanted to kind of, uh, and we can go back to these in Q and A, but we wanted to kind of give you a high level overview of like what, um, what the different paths are and kind of how to dig in. We're not expecting you to like read these slides, and memorize them, there won't be a test. <laughs> um, oh, I was gonna walk through these. So, so the adoption timeline, you want to take that away, Laura? Sure, sure, yeah. So now where do we stand in our time frame? If you can move to the next slide. Obviously, we are a little beyond uh, the December, but in December of last year, the end of the year, the technical guidance documentation for the new stretch and opt-in code came out. Um, we'll have links to that technical guidance at the end. It's invaluable and uh, you know really, a must read if you're on this call. <laughs> um, after moving beyond that in January, uh, the January 1st came the residential stretch code came into effect. Um, so if you're working in residential, you probably are already aware, but uh, this is already starting to apply to you. And as Allison mentioned, uh, the warrant articles also early January came out uh, for you know, started to be put in place for some, some uh, municipalities. And the next slide, as Allison said, uh, Brookline and Watertown have already adopted the opt-in stretch code, which is amazing. And uh, we, we foresee as uh, town meetings come up in the spring and early summer, more will be uh, in effect. So, and that moves them into a later timeline or an earlier timeline. Uh, the July uh, uh, July 1st will be our commercial stretch code will go into effect and the um, base energy code also. So that will be a busy time for a number of folks, I think, um, with those changes. And then uh, as we move forward into January of 2024, the opt-in stretch code for multifamily um, to meet meeting passive house, greater than five stories, meeting passive house goes into effect. And then further, again, this waterfall, you're seeing the January and July, and the uh, Jan uh, July of 2024, the lowering of the HERS values for the residential, the relative performance path ends for commercial multifamily and the opt-in stretch for multifamily greater than six stories needs to meet passive house. So you know, there's, you can see the, there's a progression here that we're going to keep rolling through. So with further, no further ado, I will turn it over to Christiane and Amy to walk us through the residential code. Right. I'll, we'll start with the, <clears throat> excuse me, the thermal envelope pieces. Amy Lotkovo with DSK Architects. I'm also on Andover's um, Green Advisory Board. So, and this is, we're in the pink and red branch, as Allison was saying. Um, so on the residential decision tree, for projects three stories or fewer and less than 12,000 square feet, we follow the low-rise residential energy code. Next slide, please. A big step here, as Allison mentioned, is that now the code applies to existing buildings, which are categorized as additions, alterations, or change of use. A thousand square feet is our breakpoint for additions. An addition larger than a thousand square feet will need to meet our 502.3 prescriptive and HERS, and stretch HERS, and we'll go through the, what those are. Note that, and this is from the DOER technical guidance document, the HERS certification can be demonstrated on just the addition, or for the addition and the existing building together. An addition which is larger than 100% of existing condition floor area must also meet hers and follow the table. An addition smaller than the thousand square feet will follow base code. 
prescriptive or hers. Level three alterations, um, which are less than half of the square footage is renovated per IEBC, must also meet hers and follow table R406.5. Next slide, please. The residential base code has prescriptive thermal envelope updates, but projects eligible for prescriptive compliance are limited now and primarily apply to existing buildings, alterations, and additions. The prescriptive thermal envelope updates include higher R values from IECC 2018 um, to 2021 in the ceiling, the wood framed wall, and the depth of perimeters and slabs. Energy Star is no longer a compliance pathway. Next slide, please. Following the prescriptive pathway also requires compliance with sections R401 through 404, R408, and Appendix RB Solar Ready. Christiane will present on R403 on mechanical ventilation. In R408, two additional efficiency packages are required. Some options are enhanced thermal envelope performance, more efficient HVAC equipment, reduced energy use and service water heating. And these packages have been amended by the state. So be sure to refer to the stretch amendments because we go more efficient than the base code. And Appendix RB, solar ready. Next slide, please. This section, this appendix, is not that different from RA that we use right now. Um, it applies for new construction, except additions under 1,000 square feet with, we need the 600 square feet of roof area, and it needs to be in that 110 to 270 of two north. And we're gonna provide that dedicated solar zone for future solar system installation on our construction documents. We're gonna confirm our structural loads. We're gonna provide reserve panel space in our electrical panel, and we're gonna provide a capped roof penetration sleeve. This doesn't apply if you've got a permanently installed on-site renewable energy system um, or if your solar ready zone is shaded 70 degrees of daylight hours annually. Next slide, please. We now have an EV ready space requirement. <clears throat> we need to provide wiring and electrical service for electrical vehicle charging for a 50 amp branch circuit in a one and two family. So this is a NEMA diagram there. And, um, and then for a 20% of spaces with a 40 amp circuit for all or other R use buildings. And that needs to be capable of um, that AC level two charging. So we're all gonna learn a lot about electrical vehicles. Next slide, please. So this table I mentioned earlier, R406.5, mixed fuel buildings will need a HERS rating of 52, while buildings with PV or all electric can be 55, and solar electric buildings can be 58. So we're allowed a higher HERS rating the more electrical and PV we provide. These numbers are going to drop in 18 months. See that column after July 2024? To 42 for mixed fuel and 45 for electric. And the third column is the alterations or change of use. Next slide, please. This chapter, the RC it applies to low rise residential R use, excuse me, R use occupancy defined as residential buildings by section R202 in the Mass 10th edition, IECC 2021. This includes detached one and two family dwellings, townhouses, and group R2, R3, and R4 buildings, three stories or fewer in height above grade. Buildings with four stories or more above the grade plane follow the commercial chapter, except that multifamily buildings less than 12,000 square feet of total condition floor area of any height may follow this chapter. So the zero energy pathway takes us to RC 102, all electric pathway takes us to RC 103, and the mixed fuel pathway, we're going to look at RC 104 and 105. Now new homes less than 4,000 square feet can do any of the above. New homes with a dwelling unit greater than 4,000 square feet must do um, one or two in the optional specialized code. The definition for all electric building dictates that no combustion equipment can be used on site for space heating, water heating, cooking, or clothes drying. Exterior generators and outdoor propane grills may be included in all electric buildings, however. Indoor gas fireplaces and propane gas cooktops may not be included. Next slide, please. Again, with the optional specialized code, mixed fuel buildings are required to be ready for future electric conversion in the opt-in code. Homes built with non-electric fireplaces and gas or propane cooking equipment comply with the mixed fuel compliance path. 
Mixed fuel residences must install sufficient electrical service, space, and wiring to allow for future conversion to all electric buildings. And again, I'm within the optional, I'm speaking optional right now. This is the opt-in. The specialized code requires all new buildings to be designed with electric service and wiring sufficient for future electrification of space and water heating, as well as any combustion equipment appliance loads. And this slide, this summarizes um, the stretch requirements by building size, all electric or mixed fuel, minimum efficiency of HERS, FIAS core, FIAS zero or FEE, which is Passive House International, full electrification or pre-wiring, minimum wiring for electric vehicle parking, and renewable energy generation on site. All electric new homes of any size, as well as additions and alterations, do not have different requirements in the opt-in from the stretch code. New mixed fuel dwellings under 4,000 square feet would require solar install and wired for electric. So that's that one circled in yellow. And then mixed fuel building, new buildings over 4,000 square feet would be required to be net zero via either the pathway of HERS 42 plus solar or FIAS zero. And now Christiane will take us through our 403 mechanical requirements. Okay, so now with the new codes, even with the base one, every building, every residence has to have mechanical ventilation. We can no longer count on operable windows or leaky envelope. And the mechanical ventilation has to meet both the ASHRAE 62.2 and the International Mechanical Code. And the systems must continuously operate during occupied hours. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so how do we do that? The mechanical ventilation, we can use HRVs or ERVs. Both exhaust air and both bring in fresh outside air. So what's the difference? An HRV is a heat recovery ventilator. So it recovers heat, cooling, temperature only, and is rarely used in New England because we have humidity and we have very dry air. So we need to use the energy recovery ventilators, which recover heat, cooling, and the humidity. So in the summer, the incoming air gets tempered a bit temperature-wise and lowered humidity. In the winter, it gets te tempered higher temperature, and it can take some of that moisture from the exhaust air and put it into, in, into the incoming air. And that's the recommended option for New England. Next slide, please. Installation requirements for ERVs. So one big item is that the outdoor, the exhaust duct and the intake ducts must both have gravity or motorized dampers that close when the ventilation exhaust system is not in operation. So we don't have passively have cold air coming in through an intake that's on the roof and it just dribbles into the house. The systems must be tested and verified by a HERS rater they can check if it's that the ductwork's not leaking and that the uh, operating hours are set properly. Another important item is the fan sound. If we have, there are some ERVs that are, can be installed right in the space. However, now that we're required to have these operate 24 seven, homeowners, people, we don't wanna have to listen to a fan going all the time. So that's why they require these to be very quiet with a 1.0 maximum zone rating unless we have a remote fan. So we have a grill or a, a, an exhaust grill in a bathroom, for example, but the fan's up in the attic and is minimum four feet away from the exhaust or supply grill. Then we don't have to meet that 1.0 shown level. Next slide, please. How do we implement the installation of those ERVs? There are generally two approaches. One is that we have a dedicated bathroom exhaust fan as usually done that just gets turned on and off. And then in addition to that, we have a separate dedicated ERVs. These ERVs will exhaust air from a common area and supply air to a common area and or tie that supply air into the return duct of a fan call unit. The other option is we use the ERVs as bathroom exhausts and have them run and exhaust air out of the bathrooms and then introduce fresh air back into common areas mentioned above or also can be ducted into the return of a fan call unit. The preferred option is to really duct it into the return air of a fan call unit 
as long as both of them are going to be running. And then this way, because if we just introduce air off an ERV in the summer, it's going to be more warm and humid than space temperature. And in the winter, it might be 50 degree air that we're dumping into a hallway somewhere. So it might not be that comfortable. Either option be set up for two speed operation. For example, we can have an ERV that exhausts air from a bathroom that will at its base speed, just exhaust, say, for example, the 45 CFM required per code, and it just runs continuously at that. And then if someone uses the bathroom, takes a shower with a wall or light switch and a timer, it can ramp up and exhaust 80 CFM out of the bathroom. So those are the options that can be done. And that's it. Uh, no other slide for me. I believe Patrick is now talking about the commercial update updated stretch code. Thank you. So shifting gears into commercial, uh, next slide, please. Uh, similar uh, approach with a, a flow diagram. There are a lot of different pathways and specifically within the Massachusetts uh, stretch code, there are five pathways that we'll go through here. Next slide, please. The five pathways are prescriptive, targeted performance, relative performance, relative performance is the one that everyone's probably the most familiar with, uh, passive house and hers. Next, please. So the first uh, prescriptive path is uh, applicable to small projects, projects under 20,000 square feet. Uh, and here it is relatively straightforward in that you follow the provisions of the International Energy Conservation Code 2021 edition with Massachusetts amendments. And we'll touch on those amendments in a little bit later. Next. Next are, is the targeted energy, uh, targeted performance pathway. These are called TEDIs, Thermal Energy Demand Intensities. Um, and what they are essentially creating for most project types uh, over 20,000 square feet are mandated uh, performance levels, the maximum amount of energy demand for heating and for cooling uh, for different sizes and, and occupancies of buildings. Now, this is different than in the past where uh, energy model might show relative performance compared to a baseline. These are absolute numbers. And to achieve them will require relatively stringent uh, attention uh, to the building envelope, to the effectiveness of the energy recovery on uh, the ventilation, et cetera. Next is relative performance. So I want to take a beat here uh, to acknowledge that there are some pretty significant changes within the uh, approach to energy modeling as of you know, this code. So the stretch code historically has utilized ASHRAE's standard 90.1 Appendix G for modeling. That used to be showing overall building energy reduction. Now, the focus is on reducing regulated energy. So what you're seeing here is showing that regulated energy are the energy uh, end uses that we as design professionals have some control over. That means the heating, the cooling, the fans, the lights, et cetera. The miscellaneous equipment, the plug loads are unregulated energy. So the way that this new uh, calculation within Appendix G works is that we have to show our energy savings within regulated energy. Next, please. So that savings is a uh, relatively aggressive uh, savings and is dependent on the occupancy type of the building. So what you're seeing is if a baseline of 100 um, is compared to say a healthcare facility, we have to show at least a 41% savings. We have to get down to 59% of that baseline uh, within the hospital for the regulated energy is effectively um, what is being asked. The targets get more stringent for other types of properties. Generally, a lot of our projects uh, in the commercial market sector will probably fall into that all others category, which is targeting roughly a 50% reduction in uh, regulated energy compared to the baseline. Next. 
The next pathway is Passive House, uh, achieving Passive House pre-certification. Uh, so uh, you, know, you heard a bit about this in the residential component. We're seeing the adoption of Passive House more at the commercial scale, uh, especially for large multifamily projects. Uh, here, the goal is to achieve pre-certification, uh, to go through the design process and to uh, have that third party review. There are provisions, I should note, that uh, if the certification is not uh, fully awarded at the time of occupancy, that there uh, are some provisions to, to, um, to address that as long as you are you know, submitting the documentation and going through the certification process. Next. And the last pathway is the HERS rating. Uh, this is uh, very similar to uh, what Amy shared earlier. Uh, generally speaking, you know, for commercial projects, they're probably most likely going to follow one of the other uh, pathways uh, in our experience, but there is a HERS pathway similar to the residential uh, code pathway for commercial projects as well. Next. So transitioning into the Massachusetts amendments, these are mandatory provisions uh, that are edited within uh, the Massachusetts code applied to the IECC. Uh, we're gonna go through some of them, but not necessarily all of them. And this is where I will uh, you know, use our partners uh, from BR plus A to go through some of these. But at a high level, we're gonna talk about the applicability of the code and some of the envelope requirements, efficiency requirements, energy recovery, solar readiness, and EV charging infrastructure. Next, please. So this is really important. Historically, the stretch code has not applied to renovations. Now it does. It has historically applied only to large buildings. Now it applies to buildings at 20,000 square feet or above. So it applies to new buildings and to additions over 20,000 square feet. It applies to additions even smaller than 20,000 square feet if you're adding onto an even smaller building. If you are say, have a 10,000 square foot building and you're adding a 15,000 square foot addition, that addition needs to comply because it's larger than the building itself. Next is uh, alterations, I'm sorry, uh, alterations uh, to existing structures they will have some forgiveness on the relative performance of the building envelope. So here, the, uh, the building envelope no longer is being compared to the existing. It will be compared to a 10% worse than code envelope. So generally speaking, uh, this is really going to force a lot of project teams to upgrade the building envelope when they touch that assembly in, in an alteration. Next. So additionally, we have an envelope backstop. Uh, this is something that's been in the code for uh, some time now, uh, but now uh, it is more important than ever. Uh, what we are finding is that generally speaking, triple pane glazing is becoming much, much more common. Uh, generally speaking, over a 30, 35% window to wall ratio uh, is typically triggering that triple pane glazing uh, requirement. Uh, there are also uh, focused uh, amendments on thermal bridging performance, and there are mandated uh, air leakage testing requirements at the end of construction uh, performed by a third party. Now for large buildings and commercial, uh, you can test representative areas rather than the entire building. And for large multifamily buildings, you can test 20% of the dwelling units. Next. So it's important to really drive home Patrick's point about the envelope backstop being more strict. So uh, there's really two pathways that one can use for the stretch code. Um, there's a, a highly glazed pathway, which is greater than 50% glazed wall system. Keep in mind that that includes spandrel, even if it's not vision glass, if it's a, a glazed wall system that includes the opaque areas that are part of the curtain wall, that's on the right or there's a low glazed wall system, less than 50% of the total wall area. And what each of those options gives you is a limit in terms of the overall average vertical facade U value. You can see on the, on the right, it's a 0.16. On the left, it's a 0.1285. The 0.16 is pretty similar to what we've been used to in the, in the current 
version of the stretch code until this new one came into effect. Uh, so that seems familiar, uh, but they're being more strict about how you have to account for thermal bridging. So you may find that if you're more accurately accounting for all your thermal bridging, that your performance is, is a little bit worse and you have to do better to get to that threshold. But there's a catch. If you go to the next slide, If you do the 50%, larger than 50% glazed wall system, and your building is not a high ventilation building, and you're following that right, right hand most path on this flow diagram, the catch is you have to do fully electric for space heating. You can no longer get away with uh, a hybrid, you know, fossil fuel and electric building or just fossil fuel buildings. So watch out for those highly glazed curtain wall buildings. You may be triggering. Uh, fully electric solution. And also we've been coming, becoming more and more familiar with blower door testing, but now it is going to be mandatory for all stretch code projects. Um, there's uh, different requirements for if you're using a uh, base code also has to do a blower door test, but the stretch code has a stricter threshold in terms of the leakage rate. And if you don't pass, you have to go back and fix and retest until you get pretty close to the, the original threshold. So worst case, after you after you fix everything, you can't be above a 0.45 CFM per square foot at 75 pascals for stretch code buildings. So getting into some of the mechanical impacts. So there are revised equipment efficiency tables within the code, and this also includes the addition of some new equipment types as part of this. Um, there is automatic fault detection and diagnostic systems that are required for all buildings over 100,000 square feet. In terms of lighting and electrical, the lighting power densities are pretty similar to the previous Massachusetts amendments. But the code has clarified that when using space by space method that any unfinished or shell spaces have a watts per square foot of 0.2 um, to be included in the calc. Um, automatic plug control has been included in ASHRAE 90.1 for quite a while. So this is turning off receptacles when someone is not in the space. This is now required in IECC as well. So this is essentially required on all projects. And energy, energy monitoring systems are required in buildings over 25,000 square feet. Addition, ad additional efficiency measures have been in the code for a little while. Previously in Massachusetts, you had to choose three out of 10 options. And so they have changed the way this is set up. So now projects need to have 15 total credits and the amount that each category is allowed to get de is um, dependent on the different building types. So Massachusetts has removed all fossil fuel sections related to efficiency, but they replaced it with a new renewable energy space heating. And so if a project decides to follow that renewable space energy heating in Massachusetts, they do receive all 15 points. And that essentially sets the project up for, for success here. Otherwise you have to choose a combination of these various things such as improved cooling efficiency, reduced lighting controls, you know, heat pump water heater, reduced air infiltration. So they do have a lot of options in order to hit those 15 points. Energy recovery has also been in the code for a while. And so you're looking at a 75% effectiveness or better. When you're thinking multifamily or hospitality, um, you do have to supply that outside air directly to the space and not into the corridor. Um, for other space types, you're looking at a weighted average calculation and labs are able to follow sensible energy recovery, but you're looking at 50% effectiveness or greater for that. Solar readiness um, is something that projects that are five stories or less do need to include in the projects. And so as part of this, you're looking to leave 40% of the roof area for future PV. And you do have to have signage kind of breaking out this area of the roof. Um, you have to include space for future energy storage. Um, structurally, you need to take into account the weight of um, you know, five pounds per square foot of load. And you have to you know, indicate the conduit pathways and essentially do everything but install you know, the, the panels and everything themselves.
EV charging in the base code or in, in the code within Massachusetts, you are looking at setting it up for future EV charging. So for residential and business occupancies, you're looking at 20% of spaces to be provided with future EV. Other projects, you're looking at a 10% threshold. It is worth noting that the city of Boston's requirements are much more stringent. So in the city of Boston, you're looking at 25% of all new parking spaces being provided with EV chargers day one. And then the other 75% of those spaces do have to be EV ready. So you're looking at 100% of spaces um, when it comes to the city of Boston. And as part of this, multiple spaces can share a branch circuit, um, but there is a, a, you know, a lot of, of setup required. So did anybody get the sense that the stretch code is actually pretty darn strict? <laughs> Almost all of the, the big moves towards our net zero goals are actually happening in the stretch code itself. So you don't, you don't even necessarily, not to dissuade people from opting in, but you're actually in a good spot even if you're just in the stretch code. Now, if your town does decide to move into the, the specialized opt-in, there are some additional requirements that help us you know, move towards full decarbonization. So I think we mentioned this earlier, uh, the, the Brookline and Watertown already ad adopted the specialized opt-in. So as of July 1st, they will be under the new specialized opt-in stretch code. Keep an eye on any town you're doing projects in because they can approve it at any time. And then it will roll into that next cycle, either January 1st or July 1st, whichever is uh, at least six months after, depending on how they um, decide to adopt in the timeline. So you've got a little window of warning, but you got to keep your eye on the ball and not get caught off guard. Um, for code compliance, for multifamily, we described this earlier, there are a few pathways, but those pathways are very quickly shutting down and only allowing passive house. So if you're six stories or higher, January 1st, 2024, uh, if you're below six stories, it's actually January 1st, 2023. Uh, as long as you're over 12,000 square feet, you are required to do passive house. So keep an eye on that too. And finally, for commercial buildings, um, there are three pathways under the specialized opt-in. There is zero energy. So you have to have enough on-site renewable energy, not off-site, on-site to get to zero. There's mixed fuel buildings and there's all electric buildings. Now you'd think um, mixed fuel would be easier, but uh, if you're over the 0.5 CFM a square foot, you still have to wire the building to be able to go fully electric in the future. So the mixed fuel is not a get out of jail free card on electrical infrastructure. You still are gonna have to put it in. For the all electric buildings, um, you, you may have to comply with passive house, uh, you do have to do all electric heating and hot water. The other thing for the mixed fuel buildings, besides wiring for all electric, is you have to do on-site renewable energy, uh, either 1.5 watts a square foot or 75% of the available roof area. So there's some additional requirements on the uh, mixed fuel option that you got to watch out for. So it's not just a it's not just an easy pass. All right, so thanks to everyone for walking us through all of that dense information. Um, I've been, we've been tr keeping track of the questions in the chat. Um, we are lucky to have Ian Finlinson from DOER answering some of the questions as we go along. Um, we wanted to share with you just a screenshot of what you're gonna get in uh, the PDF that we'll distribute on the BSA website, a link to this presentation will be available so you'll have all of these notes and charts and you'll have these links. Um, but we have really pulled from the NEEP uh, website. There are, um, there's a three really great overview resources there, very text heavy, but there's a frequently asked questions document, a residential document and a commercial document that really help you figure out like what to look at more closely. The DOER is also, um, issuing technical guidance and I want to be clear that the technical guidance document PDF that we're referencing is in draft form. So if there is more information that you feel needs to be in there or you have questions or there's a part that says forthcoming, 
please post your questions on the DOER website so that those um, answers can be included in the final document. In addition, there are modeling guidelines for both TEDI and Appendix G available there and a Excel sheet for schedule and loads guidelines. So there's DOER is quickly, as quickly as possible, releasing um, some information to help us figure out how to implement the code. Um, there's also an unofficial version of the 10th edition if you need to look at that. Um, we've also included our emails here. Um, and as we said, we are not the be all end all experts, but we have been really trying to get our heads around this. So we're happy to, to help, help anyone connect with the right resources. Um, so going through some of the questions in the chat, I'm just going to go through them in order. Um, and feel free, anyone that was one of the panel presenters. Um, I'll, I'll try to call on people to Andrew um, Kolar asked if I think this was about the residential code. So Amy, if you could look at this, is that a 1000 square foot footprint or the combined square footage of all proposed floors of the addition? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't see that question yet. So let me think about that and look at that unless Ian, you have it off the top of your head. Sorry, I'm, I'm just getting through the questions now. Yeah. while we're giving Amy a second to uh, think that through, I, uh, this gives us a, just a quick opportunity to say too, we, as we talked about, this is a series. And so um, using our emails uh, to reach out to any of the BSA groups or, or the SDL group to, if you like a version of this or an interest, uh, you know, if you have an idea of what you would see for the next in the series, as we've talked about, we're thinking that it would be commercial and residential broke out separately, knowing with these questions are very specific to either of those and we could get dig in deeper. Um, but if there are other ideas, we'd be, we'd be very happy to facilitate that. All right, and I just saw the question. So, um, and the, the question was, is that a 1,000 square foot footprint or the combined square footage of all proposed floors of the addition? And my understanding is that it's conditioned floor area, so it would not be a footprint. It is a uh, square footage. Yeah, I, I would second that. Um, it's, the, it's the total conditioned floor area addition, uh, even if that's two different wings or something of a building or two different floors. Um, I do think it's going to lead to clients growing interest in 950 square foot additions, but um, we're okay with that. Okay, the next um, question that Andrew had was, do EV parking requirements apply to properties that do not have off-street parking on site? I believe there's an exception for that in the residential code. Like, obviously, if you don't have a parking space, you may not have to do that, but that's something you could really dig into the code more. Um, or in, in the residential um, section, we could get more into the details of mm -hmm. the exceptions. It is allowed that the, the, the EV is across the street. Got it. Um, Danielle had a question about a residential addition being less than a thousand square feet if it meets the HERS writing, but the existing building does not. How how is that kind of done? Is the yeah? So I couldn't off. find the spot in the code that said this, but the technical guidance document, and that's why I read that quote because I was like, okay, that's important information. Was that the HERS certification can be demonstrated on just the addition or for the addition and the existing building together? And so, just just to add a little clarity on that, if I may. Um, so HERS ratings generally only work or not generally, only work on a complete dwelling unit. So the situation where you're doing a house rating on just the addition is if the addition is, for example, an in law apartment or something that can be treated as a, a dwelling unit. Um, and so that type of project, I think, is going to have an easier time uh, and is, from a policy perspective, something we're more encouraging of than someone expanding an existing house uh, where they're going to have to then do the house rating on the entirety of the house. Um, so um, I, I do think that is going to be an important message to get out to 
to developers because there's quite a lot of redevelopment work that would trigger that right now. Got it, thank you. Uh, Lori of Goody Clancy asked, are envelope upgrades triggered by level three alteration change of use or by intervening with the envelope? Um, I believe, Lori, you're probably thinking about um, the commercial provisions. Um, right, yeah. And I'm wondering if Diane or Lauren, um, who have dug more into that, would like to weigh in on that answer. Are they, Allison, you, can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, Lori asked, are envelope upgrades triggered by level three alteration slash change of use or by intervening with the envelope? We are still working through the details of what triggers um, the, and, and working through the details of the actual alterations and definitions of that. So I think that that is something that would probably be better for us to follow up on that answer versus answering correctly at this time. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, because I think I think the um, the intention is that uh, the stretch code commercial sections would align with whatever it says in the existing building definition. So if you are replacing the entire envelope, you would want to follow the stretch code in the Massachusetts amendments. But if you are just replacing windows only, that that that's a replacement. That's not level three. Ian, do you have any clarification on that? Yeah, so the thing I would say is that residential and commercial are different here um, in that in residential we're saying if if you're doing a level three alteration or you're adding more than a thousand square feet, the level three alterations are impacting more than a thousand square feet, then we are triggering a whole house upgrade or, or this first upgrade. In commercial, we, we don't say that, um, at least for small commercial, we basically say if your uh, alteration or addition is less than 20,000 square feet, then you follow the prescriptive path, but the prescriptive path under the stretch code, so you've got things like thermal bridging to contend with, but that it is implemented the same way as it would be today so uh, if you're touching an element of the envelope, you have to bring that up to code, but it isn't triggering changes to other portions of the structure. Um, so residential is the only place where touching one part of the envelope potentially triggers changes in the rest of the structure. Um, now, exceptions to that are, are in line with what's in the code already, if there's a change of use, if you're taking a non-residential use to a residential use, and that's going to increase energy, then that impacts the whole building. But that, that's already the case. Thank you. Um, there was some chat from Diane, Rand, and Ian about um, outreach to code officials. I believe those were answered in the chat. Um, so I, I'm not going to review those. Um, Adam and Ian were speaking about um, the requirement for new commercial buildings less than 20,000 square feet. Do they follow base code or do they follow the prescriptive compliance requirements of the stretch code? Um, Ian, do you want to go through that response? Because I, I believe you still have to follow the amendments, even if you're following base code, which might be some of the source of confusion. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, and I, Adam, I give you a very short answer, but I, I think you, you followed it. Um, yeah, so if you have, say, a 10,000 square foot uh, project, um, then you can use the prescriptive path, and we imagine quite a lot of people would choose to do that. Um, we're working with NML to upgrade the ComCheck model, so you can use ComCheck but you would be following the prescriptive path of the stretch code, not the prescriptive path of the base code. Um, and that's going to be significantly more stringent on the envelope side. And you can also follow other paths as well, but they involve modeling. And so for small projects, we wanted to, to keep a prescriptive option. Thank you. 
Um, Michael had asked about uh, commercial alterations, what's the trigger for envelope requirements? I believe we kind of touched on that with Lori's question earlier, kind of what is the trigger for envelope? Um, Michael, do you feel like your question was answered or do you have any anything else? Um, it wasn't clear. Yes, th that was answered, thank you. Okay. Um, Christopher Gray had a, a note um, just that triple glazing seems to be the, the new normal. And Stephen Moore um, maybe lives in Somerville, it's like Somerville's close to opting in. And there was some chatter about um, whether other New England states are following our code. And um, yeah, other, other states and municipalities are doing different things. Ian answered that. Um, Aviva had a question about the stretch code, not the opt in and wanted to know if clients, um, if there are clients that still want to use a gas system, do you still have to be electric ready and what are the requirements? So Aviva, you, you may need to come on um, off mute and speak to whether you're talking about commercial buildings or residential buildings, because the answer would be different. Yeah, sorry, it, it, it's for a commercial building, uh, basically just trying to confirm whether the, um, electric ready requirements are just for the opt-in codes or uh, if there's any extra requirements for a mixed fuel or a like gas fired boiler system in a commercial stretch code building. Jacob, do you wanna try answering that? Sure, the, the only thing in the stretch code that can trigger uh, a, a some degree of electrification for commercial uh, non-residential buildings that I'm aware of off the top of my head is the um, is the higher winter to wall ratio or higher glazed wall system and using that higher U value of the 0.16, that's gonna trigger um, full electrification uh, for buildings with low ventilation rates, below the 0.5 CFM per square foot. I don't know if Ian, you had anything to add to that. Uh, no, that's a, a very accurate answer. So for the lower window to wall ratio, if we keep beneath that threshold, there's yeah, if you an stay below the, requirement. the fifty percent, uh, and it's not window to wall ratio, it's it's a, a basically a curtain wall system essentially, where it could be both vision and opaque sections. If that you know kind of poor performing envelope system is used uh, for more than fifty percent, that's what's going to trigger the electrification. And the higher you value, I guess, Ian. There was one thing that that even I wasn't totally sure about is, let's imagine a scenario where you have more than a fifty percent glazed wall system, but you're somehow able to insulate it, you know, with backup walls and great performing systems, to hit the point one two eight five U value. Can you follow the point one two eight five pathway and not electrify? Um, that's a great question, and I think we should put that in the guidelines, but yes, the, I, I think we should allow that. Uh, the intent would be, if your envelope can perform, then you don't have to fully electrify. If your envelope can't meet that backstop threshold, then we're essentially giving designers the opportunity to use it, but in return for that, requiring full electrification of space heating. Thanks, Ian. And one one thing to keep in mind as towns are you know towns and cities that you're working in if they have climate plans they are likely to adopt the opt-in so it is a bit of a risk if you're looking at a project that might be built a year or two out to not um, evaluate both options um I, I would assume a lot of cities and towns are going to do the overlay of opt-in um, to um, make sure that projects are electrified for low um, low ventilation rebuildings. So you want you want to see if you can get that infrastructure in there. Um, Gary had a question about meeting solar requirements. Um, as we know, a lot of schools use and you know. Low, lower budget projects might use a PPA instead of buying the panels outright and would um, not owning the panels, but leasing your, your roof um, 
enable compliance with the code? I think this is a DOER question. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Um, yeah, we don't really have an opinion on the ownership model. It's really a question of is there on site generation or not? Um, so, when, so PPAs are fine. So, you'd have to have that agreement in place to get your um, certificate of occupancy, or how, how would that work? Implementation? Well, I think we'd be looking at the, the local uh, building inspector would be looking for installation of a system. Okay. So um, you probably yeah. So so the timing of the PPA contract is somewhat relevant. It's more is the installed system present, and you can get certificate of occupancy while still waiting for an interconnection agreement from the utility, for example. Great, thank you. Um, Danny Garber Leticia. Um, describes an affordable housing project that has a tight budget and the project is in a green community and an early adopter, but the project won't be permitted. The cost of fees may not be possible, but there's a chance that the city would adopt. What is the risk? Uh, I think amongst us here, we're kind of thinking all residential projects should be taking advantage of the mass save um, incentives for FIAS, and um, that can really take care of a lot of the soft costs of FIAS for multifamily. And um, if you As, don't design to the strict pathway, there there is a risk kind of starting next month. Um, you should really be looking very closely at FIAS for multifamily. Go ahead, Laura. Oh, and as well as the Inflation Reduction Act, um, there's a lot of uh, you know, incentives available there uh, that could also benefit. Uh, I think that that's a, another good pathway, but I, I think, you know, I, obviously Ian can weigh in as well, but they, I think that there, there's quite a risk um, to, to not needing that. Yeah, I mean, I think you've given good answers. I would say if you're really concerned and you have an active project, reach out to, to us um, or, uh, Mass Clean Energy Center, and um, we just want to make sure that the design team has the resources to, to look at this. Um, we, we don't think it will be a problem to meet uh, FIAS or PHI um, with the resources that are available, but we recognize that that's a big step for a lot of design teams who maybe haven't done that yet, and the learning curve on the first project is significant. Um, we're also uh, in the process of applying for additional federal funds to provide more uh, code implementation support. Um, and we're thinking about a sort of um, construction verification stipend for affordable housing and then potentially expanding that if we get the funds to, to further help design teams take on the soft cost portion of doing this. So, um, yeah, so. If you're thinking that this is a difficult thing to do, then uh, talk to us and talk to others and uh, we want to help make it easier. And one thing on that note, in terms of funding, Mass Save Residential Construction Program, um, the new residential construction, it, the threshold has been 5% to qualify for Mass Save programs for all home starts. However, uh, they have revised it that residential construction will need 15% savings to qualify. For mass save program for all home starts after well well currently um, and then current homes are going to need to finish before July 1st 2023 to qualify for that five percent threshold and I'm wondering maybe there's a way to when we're thinking broad policy picture that um, that we not have to increase those thresholds <laughs> great point Amy thank you um, Alejandra has a note here about uh, commercial code. Um, she's asking if DOER could address the logic behind the Teddy thresholds and process. Um, the requirement includes creating a brand new energy model with prescribed loads, schedules, mechanical systems, and where the only variables impacting performance are envelope and heat recovery effectiveness. However, meeting code minimum values from backstop and what does not lead to meeting the Teddy thresholds. 
is the code contradicting itself? However, or moreover, many consultants have pointed out the Teddy thresholds are impossible to meet, which means all offices, schools, libraries, et cetera, will be forced to follow passive house, including projects that are currently in SD and DD. So I'm following this to you, Ian. Yeah, that, thanks. And, and this is, I'm actually glad this question came up because I think there's a lot of confusion around the Teddy pathway and the intent of the Teddy pathway. So um, the intent of the Teddy pathway is that it is less onerous than the passive house pathway. Um, and the, the modeling work that was done for us to set those thresholds certainly showed that, uh, that it was uh, required sort of less envelope work than, than meeting uh, passive house. Um, so if people are finding the opposite, then that suggests that um, that the input assumptions that are, are being used are different. And we are going to uh, revise the Teddy guidance that's out in the technical guidance document just to provide a bit more flexibility and a bit more clarity on, on how to do that. So the, the intent of the Teddy model is that it is a little bit of an abstraction from the final building model. Uh, in order to have some sort of apples to apples comparison. Um, but I think um, we've been hearing a lot of pushback on not making it too abstract from, from the final building. Um, and, um, and yeah, the, the intent sort of philosophy behind Teddy is to, to have folks think about the envelope, um, the, the air ceiling, the solar gains, uh, and the energy recovery. Um, sort of early in the design process so that then the mechanical system that that is needed can can be downsized um, it's so it's similar philosophically to a, a passive house approach but it, it isn't meant to be more stringent so if you're finding that in your modeling that the teddy threshold looks harder to achieve um, then again get in touch with us um, either Either we've done something wrong or, or, or you're doing something different than we would like in the input assumptions and we want to fix that right away rather than people coming to the conclusion that Teddy is really hard. Well, that's that's not the intent here. Yeah, so and Alexandra, I guess we can follow up offline if, if that's helpful. I, I'm wondering if one of the series uh, could be a, a Teddy uh, workshop. Um, I'm wondering if that's something that, you know, if, if folks would weigh in, if that's something that might be useful. Um, I, I know that in our group, we've talked about the Teddy modeling, so maybe we can work uh, with you all and to, to set something like that up. That sounds like a great idea. It's on the list. Great. Um, the, the next, there was some chat around, um, oh, Alejandra, is there anything else you wanted to add to that question or do you feel like your question was answered adequately for now? I'm assuming it's it's good. Okay, sorry. Uh, well, we, we will be following up. Um, we're actually meeting with DOER today to review our models, but uh, we have found that it's extremely onerous and we're not the only ones. Great. Thank you for that input. Um, Gary also um, posted again, asked if there could be a blended code published that integrates all the amendments and modifications into one document. Um, I know all of us on this call that we're putting this together, we're like found ourselves like jumping back and forth. Like you, know, you end up getting really confused with all the references and Ian, yes. We are going to work with ICC to publish a blended code. Um, yay, <laughs> that's great. And there's a lot of applause around that. Um, Lisa Goodwin-Robbins asked if HERS raters need to be independent or with, will AE firms train staff to be HERS raters as part of regular CA responsibilities? I'm not aware if there's a, I, I think one of our slides said hers readers have to be third party. Amy and Christian, do you have any input on that? 
Yes, and I think Ian did answer it too. Um, oh, that it, HERS graders can work for AE firms, but they also need to be registered with the HERS provider to be subject to the same QAQC requirements. Right. Yeah. Catching up with in the, the residential years. world, they're using the um, software, the modeling software Ecotrope, um, and that's kind of dominating the residential market. But yes, HERS readers will be busier. And Gary has expresses a concern that there's a going to be a bottleneck about um, FIAS modeling and pre certifications. Um, I, I just responded to that one, but I can feel that one as well. Um, yeah, we've we've had a, a good relationship with FIAS for a number of years, and we've been actively talking to them about this. And I believe Pass Pass Massachusetts has been as well. Um, they have assured us that they are expanding their team and um, and expect to be able to accommodate this. But yeah, if you look at the the FIAS documentation language, you'll see that. You can get a certificate of occupancy prior to getting the final certification, um, provided that all the appropriate testing documentation has been submitted. Um, so, so the the passive house uh, consultant has to have completed their work, but FIAS themselves don't become a bottleneck uh, in this process. Awesome. Um, George O'Neill had a question about for an HVAC upgrade. Um, I'm assuming that's HVAC, the typo. Uh, if you're only dealing with the mechanical system, does stretch code apply? Jacob or Patrick? Yeah, the, the, the mandatory elements of the stretch code, assuming it's uh, in a stretch code town, would uh, would apply to the components that are being replaced. All right. I'm seeing what else is in the chat. Um, a lot of a lot of chatter about nonprofit revenues. Is the motion sensor lights out requirement? for all residential projects from Ann. Christiane? I don't have to say, I don't know offhand. As far as I know, it is, but I, I don't want to confirm that totally without having dug a little bit more deeper into that. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand this question. Um, is this... There's a requirement, I believe, for hotel units, but I, I'm not aware of, of this requirement in the code. Okay, looks like that one we'll need to follow up on with a more in-depth uh, review. Um, Alex Matthews states the commercial stretch code targeted performance compliance pathway requires compliance with C402 building envelope. Is that interpreted to require compliance with only the mandatory provisions or is it requiring full compliance with the prescriptive components even on non prescriptive pathway projects? That's a doozy. My understanding is whenever the code references a section as a whole, like if it says C402, it means in full. Yeah, I, I would say it, it means in full, uh, but you can use um, within 402, you can use trade-offs in the envelope provided you meet the backstop. Um, so it isn't that you have to follow every line of the U value table. Just an interpretation we sometimes get. Great input, thank you. Uh, there's some chat around the Teddy again, that will, um, sounds like a bunch of uh, people will be following up with the OERM. And Jacob has a question. Is anyone designing a lab that is using the U point 
1285 compliance path rather than the U.16 compliance path, thereby avoiding the 25% electrification requirement. Question for the audience. Jacob, was this the pathway that you were talking about? I am not, but was this what you were saying where you do this in labs because um, it's actually overall more energy efficient? Yeah, generally we're saying, look, it's a lab. The much bigger carbon benefit is to do the partial electrification. You know, and improving the envelope between the 0.16 and 0.1285 has a much smaller impact on fossil fuel consumption. So we have obviously advocate for the heat, the 25% electrification path. But I imagine that there would be some client that says, no, we don't want to deal with heat pumps. We'd rather go with the higher performing envelope. And I was just curious to see if anybody is, has a project that's going that, that route. All right, doesn't seem like it. That's good. Uh, then there's a response uh, to Gary from Ian about FIAS, which we've already discussed. Um, Stephen Burke has a question for commercial buildings required to do air tightness testing. Is there a guideline as to who can do that work? Which qualifications do they need? And do they need to be independent from the project team? I'm thinking, Ian, that is a question. Yeah, I think I can take that one. So um, I should probably hear on the ICC language, and it doesn't stipulate any certification um so uh, the team doing that work would have to demonstrate satisfactorily to the uh, code official that it is meeting the testing but i don't believe there's any uh, required qualification or certification it, it's not an easy thing to do at scale so i assume that only uh dedicated professionals can take this on, but if we see compliance being an issue, then we can we can look at amending it. And um, I would also say this is something that's coming in in the 2021 IECC for all climate zones um, five and, and up, maybe even four. Um, so there's going to be a large expansion in commercial building blood or testing across the country. So it's going to be interesting to see how the construction industry handles that. Sounds like a good jobs creation, as long as there's enough blower doors <laughs> equipment. Um, let's see what else. There's a thumbs up to Alex Matthews' question, which um, Jacob answered around C402. Um, Kate Babersky from Air Street uh, said, you know, thank you to Jacob for pointing that out. She's going to be looking at that um, compliance pathway. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> we could have all just had 25% electrified labs and been done. And, well, it's uh, not in the guidelines yet. So technically right now it's still not allowed. So, yeah. well, but if it's going to be put in there, then the people will look at that. Been difficult to Thank you. Uh, Mike yeah. from DSK asked, um, as design professionals, we are being educated here, but how are building officials and contractors and the public being educated on these changes? I think we had talked about that earlier on. I'm just going to scroll back to my notes um, around DOER's outreach. It was a question by Diane. Um, there's uh, Passive House Mass um, seminars. DOER is working with Mass Save to um, train code officials and specialized code. Um, is there anything else you want to add to that, Ian? Um, I, I spent yesterday morning with uh... Building code officials of Western Mass, um, which is which is great. Uh, I think there's a lot of interest, understandably, from the building official community to get up to speed on this very quickly. Um, so we're working with the regional code official uh, organizations. Not not every code official is going to participate through the region, 
uh, but if they do have continuing education requirements and uh, through the Mass Aid program, we're offering free energy code training. Um, again, it's taken longer than ideal to roll that out, but it is coming in the next few weeks on residential and then the next couple of months on the commercial side. So um, I, I think we've gotten their attention on, on the building code official side and, and we have a, a, a plan to reach uh, most, if not all, building code officials. On the broader public engagement side, I, I think that um, in communities that are considering the specialized code, there's going to be quite a lot of outreach and education. But for a lot of communities that are staying on the stretch code, they're the ones where we think the public and um, small contractors are probably not going to have a higher uh, level of awareness. Um, in the short term, there's not a lot I think we can do about that. In the longer term, we're working with the Green Communities Division and also including this in our federal code support funding application um, to work with regional planning authorities and municipalities to, to do more sort of uh, on the ground outreach around this. And I recognize that as a design community, you folks are all shouldering some of the burden of getting the word out on this as well. So uh, thank you for, for doing that to the extent that you are. I, I will say that, you know, to, uh, there's been a, a great response to, the, to this talk today. And, and we've had um, both communities and, and, uh, and design for, um, officials reach out to us about this talk. So we know that the, you know, we're trying, <laughs> as Ian noted, to, as you know, get out the word from our side. And I think that that's with any change, it's part of, um, you know, our design community where we, we're all reaching at it um, from different aspects. I mean, I know that, you know, the Committee on the Environment, Coach is is you know we are made up of engineers, architects, and contractors. So we are you know we are trying hard to um, to reach out through that. But if the if you or if anyone has other ideas um, about how to for us to get the word out in you know sharing the series or anything else, we're we're happy to do that. I think that's the beauty of uh, you know us all working together for this. The, so this um, is. This is Christian. I just wanted to follow up on the question with the lighting control. I mean, because this new code is somewhat based on the IEC 2021. And under 404.2 interior lighting controls, it says permanently installed lighting fixtures shall be controlled with either a dimmer, an occupant sensor control, or other control that is installed or built into the fixture. And they have a couple exceptions for bathroom hallways. So it sounds like we do, although it's kind of open what they mean when they say other control, because it doesn't say what that control is supposed to do. But the way I'm reading that, it seems to imply that, yes, there needs to be some kind of motion control, occupant sensor, also in the residential. And Ian, I don't know if you read that differently or you might have a different understanding. I, I don't have the code in front of me, which is perhaps a mistake, um, and I don't have that memorized, so I can take that one back. And uh, It's 404.2, interior lighting controls. Oh, 404.2. Yep. Yep. Did you not just say that a dimmer was an okay alternative? That's what it looked, that's how it reads, shall be controlled with either a dimmer I don't know how that would save energy. An occupant sensor control or other control. Sounds like a pretty easy out if you don't want to do it. Uh, to me, it sounds like it too. Okay. That's yeah, why. And, uh, so um, as, as we've been presenting, I've been um, taking some quick notes on the responses. So. Uh, there have been a lot of interest about the slides and this recording. We will put all of that up on the BSA website and um, we'll do a quick fact check on some of the questions that have been posted in the chat. And we can also post the questions and responses that were heard during the session for reference. Um, to end today, we have about five minutes left and Joanne has a very interesting question here about um, renovations or additions to older homes and how um, 
character of old, those older homes is preserved, even if, um, e you know, even, you know, if it's not technically in a historic district, um, which I think is part of the um, alteration language, it would need to be in a historic district and you have to have some sort of documentation of that to get the historic exception. Um, I'm wondering, Amy, if you have any opinions on that. Mm, it's it's a it's a big question. I actually would ask the OER on that. It's a it's a great one. There there are ways to do it, but I think the question is, where does one need to step in? And yeah, and I, I think we're looking at a fairly small group of homes that are going to trigger this. So you're talking about something that doesn't qualify as historic. Mm -hmm but is uh, looking to have either an addition over a thousand square feet or a level three alteration over a thousand square feet. Um, I think in those cases, so it's triggering a hearse rating and you're most likely to do interior work to improve air sealing and insulation. Um, if it's already a level three alteration, then you're moving walls and, and load bearing walls at that point. So uh, improving insulation in the cavities, um, our assumption is that's going to be fairly straightforward. So, I mean, I, I, again, we could take this offline, but I'm not sure there'd be too many projects where this would require unusual measures, um, but there may be a situation and um, we're always, always interested in those type of edge scenarios, just to see if there's a need for any modification to the code to allow for that. But as we planned this and thought it through, we, we didn't see this being a problem. Uh, I also just noticed that Michael has a point about um, maintaining character and also the embodied carbon of envelope assembly. Um, so, the stretch code and the opt-in code do not um, look at the embodied carbon at all. Um, there were several of us on this call that were part of the advocacy of the code and really wanted at least disclosure or calculation of embodied carbon on, of the con new construction materials or the addition or renovation construction materials as part of the code that was not included it can be included, uh, the design teams are free to do that work. And there are some excellent um, robust calculators um, for residential work specifically like the beam tool, or you could do a whole building life cycle analysis, or you could just be aware that anything that's a plastic type insulation or spray foam is gonna be more carbon intensive due to the blowing agents. Um, but that is not regulated by the code right now. So and that, again, just to jump point. in, I would say that while it isn't in the code today, it is an area where we're seeing a lot of activity in the code development community and the design community. And we're very interested in tracking that and thinking about that as something that we could be incorporating into the next code cycle. Uh, and again, that's another area where we're looking for federal funding support to move that along. So. If you're interested in that area or working on that area, please, uh, please share um, and please continue working in that uh, arena because um, we do see that as an important policy step to take in the not too distant future. And I'm, I'm seeing some other comments about um, older homes that are outside of districts and how would we, how do we maintain the character of our communities and neighborhoods? Um, I'm thinking, Laura, this might be a topic where we look at a few case studies of how this might be done under the new code um, to give everyone some inspiration. Because I think this is an area that's important to all of us. Um, we live around, you know, a lot of existing building stock and there are a lot of creative ideas about how, how to do this well and maintain character and beauty, but get us to where we need to be for our carbon emissions. 
Yeah, and I actually think that there's a, another question with that uh, about, you know, as we bring up, you know, if slightly larger or, uh, you know, masonry buildings, maybe, um, you know, what does it mean when we're insulating? You know, we often, many of us having worked on these existing buildings know that we end up doing a full wall analysis and, and can only and it limits the amount of insulation before it starts to deteriorate. Uh, the existing walls. So I'm wondering how that plays in as well. But I think that that's uh, absolutely to your point, Alison, it'd be great to have a full conversation around uh, existing building and, and how we, we meet the, um, you know, how we would move this forward. Because, you know, we all, uh, those of us on this call are, are, you know, we're huge advocates for this, you know, moving uh, energy efficiency of buildings forward, but knowing it, it becomes a little more difficult with the existing stocks. And well, I really, I know we're going over time a bit now and, and you know, there's still a lot of folks on the line. If, um, it, you know, there, it, I feel like we're wrapping up and have hit uh, a large portion of the questions, but we really appreciate uh, everyone, all the presenters and, and folks who put the material together and, uh, you know, the BSA and the sustainable design leaders really for all the time you put in and uh, for all of you with the great questions and for being part, uh, please, you know, reach out to me. I won't offer up anyone else on the <laughs> list of necessarily, but if you have further questions or need um, or interest in, in helping us set up another of the series, we'd, we'd really love that um, to work as a community. So thank you all. And thank you to Ian, you, you know, your, your contributions are invaluable. We, we really appreciate your time as well. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.